This is a story of survival, camaraderie, and some often gruesome events that took place 60 years ago. In December 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was catapulted into a world war already underway in other parts of the globe. Within months, the Japanese had taken thousands of prisoners, many of whom remained captive until the dramatic end of this war. The Japanese considered these men captives rather than prisoners of war, which made their lives expendable and led to years of torture and slave labor. For some, chance may account for their survival. Others say it was the yearning and will to get back home, to live and to see the Japanese held accountable. This is their story, the Barbed Wire Club. When we heard that um, Honolulu was hit, Pearl was hit, they took us and put us as around the Clark Field. And we're looking up and we saw these beautiful formation of planes, not knowing that they were Japanese. And we said, geez, look at a nice formation. What is that, Navy Army? What is it? No one knew and all of they started dropping. You know, and then we knew what they weren't ours. And all of a sudden, out of the sun, here comes the Japanese Zeros. And they were armed with 20 millimeter cannings. And I hit the turf, and they were kicking up dirt in my face. They ran two ships aground, and their troops come in mainly between these two ships to protect himself against, you know, machine gun fire and rifle fire. We were told that the Japanese would be in the next day and that anybody wishing to leave should do so, that the ones who stayed would have their names turned over to the Japanese. When Singapore fell, that sealed our doom because the Japanese control all of the East. If you can picture Java, it's an island about 400 miles long and 200 miles wide and running east and west. And we were on the north side, and there were only two straits to get out. So we got, we chose Sanda Strait because somebody had given us word that the straits were clear and we could get out. Well, when we got there, here sits this whole third fleet. The night before the surrender, we, we had an earthquake. And, and at first, we thought it was the ammunition dumps that would be blown up, and because uh, 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 there was loud, loud uh, explosions during the night. But when I was sleeping on a tank, and, and the tank is shimmying, I, I said, this, this is more than that ammunition being blown up. And, and it, it was an earthquake, and it was kind of an ominous sign of things to come, that there, things were going to fall apart. We blew up the munitions on Bataan. Simultaneously with that, we had a severe earthquake. And it also affected us on Corregidor because Corregidor was shaken pretty well too. So it seemed like all the odds were against it, even nature. We were in combat with the Japanese every day until the surrender on April 9th. I slept like a baby that night. There was no shelling, no dive bombing. Woke up in the morning with a Japanese soldier poking me with a bayonet. And I could tell by the look in his eyes, he wasn't saying, get up, buddy. It's time to go to school. They said they expected a landing within the next few nights. And the reason was because the moon was right, 
there would be darkness until approximately 9.30 or 10 o'clock and then moonlight. So they anticipated having them on our island by the, the time that the moon rose. The United States government more or less ruled us off. They knew we couldn't, we couldn't last for too long. I, I just uh, the shock of uh, capitulating or surrendering was too great. I thought we'd fight right to the last man, but we never did. When a soldier surrendered, he was considered a captive, not a prisoner of war. He was nothing more than an object with a Japanese number that needed to be moved to a labor camp. Hundreds of Americans died during the marches that lay ahead. On some pretense, they had put an American soldier out of the marching ranks and, uh, and start screaming and hollering at him and beat on him and club him with their rifle butts. And, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, one or two other Americans would rush up and say, hey, you got to stop that. You leave him alone. He didn't do anything. And, and they, too, got beat and got killed. Well, it didn't take long for one to learn that if you wanted to live, you didn't go help somebody else. I saw a, a Japanese soldier taking a person behind the clump of trees. Or, it was a small hill. He took him out there, and I heard some shots fired, and he came back alone, so I had to guess that he did away with him. Well, then you got to the point to where you were mad at yourself. You were angry that you didn't have the guts to get out there and, and at least make an attempt to help. And you realize that you're not the big, strong, macho soldier that you thought you were. As they searched each one of us, they had found some Japanese currency on some men. And they had those men kneel, and then they beheaded them. And so the Japanese had the heads on the bayonet, and they were letting us know what to expect. They had broken the spirit and the camaraderie of the American soldier. You were no longer a member of A Company of the 194th or B Company of the 31st Infantry. You were a lonely, dirty, hungry, thirsty individual, driven only with a desire to survive. But then the Japanese moved us out in columns of four, and that began the death march, the so-called death march. Well, 60 miles to a soldier that is in shape is no, no problem. But the conditions of the march, and they wouldn't feed us, they wouldn't give us any water. Water was shooting out of the place, and they wouldn't let us go get it. And, and they always stopped us by the wells and uh, more or less dared us to get water. Well, we'll take a canteen cup and make a run and uh, try to get some water. Pretty soon there's so many bodies around uh, the, each well that it didn't make sense to. Uh, that's the cause of, for us being in, in such poor shape, why we didn't survive that march. And thanks God for the Philippine people. Who, have, who had the nerve and the guts to stand up to the Japanese soldier. That along the route coming out of Bataan, the Japanese, when we got out of the fighting area, Filipino people had moved back into their burials. And when, when I would reach those and the other Americans, they would have cans of water lined up along the road and packets of, of rice wrapped in banana leaves and, and, and pieces of fruit. And the Japanese soldiers would shoot them and kill them and kick the cans over. And I got hit in the head and, and buckled my knees and I went down, but I realized that if I went down, they would shoot me or bang at me. A woman was, I say a second story window, but I don't know, maybe it was just their, their houses are built up sometimes six, seven feet above the ground. 
And she's throwing a packet, and I and 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 I swear she's looking at me, and this guard next to me pulls up and shoots her out of the window. So I quit looking at the Philippine people, so that I wouldn't encourage them to do that. And we thought we had seen some hard times, but really, things went downhill from there. The cultural differences between the prisoners and their captors put the prisoners in fear of their lives. The wrong reaction could mean a beating or death. In their first six months of captivity, 5,000 Americans died. One thing you never let the Japanese do, you never flinched when they hit you, never tried to dodge a blow and never let them knock you off your feet because if you got knocked off your feet, they'd stamp on you. They put us in groups of 10. And if one person of that group escaped, the rest of the surviving group would be taken out and shot. That's what we were told. Where the hell are you gonna go if you escape? You know, you're in the middle of nowhere. The Japanese, you couldn't understand them. One day they'd say, okay, Johto would mean good, okay. The next day, you say the same thing, bang, you knock you on your butt. If there were too many men to be punished, they would line the men up in two lines facing one another and ask one group to beat the other side. They would walk along, make sure that you were hitting them hard enough. Then they would have the side that would be getting the beating turn around and beat the ones that had been doing the beating. Well, when you go to the hill, you're in trouble because that's where you stand in front of the commander's shack where he lived. You know, or the first sergeant. When I get up there, he told me to, to take off my blouse. My, I had no undershirt. So he stripped me down to just my pants. And he takes his uh, Sam Brown belt, takes his sword out, sets it aside, takes the belt, folds it up, and he gave me 11 lashes across the face. After the 34th lash, that the Sam Brown belt, it's a pretty good sized belt. I didn't feel anything. But the tears came because you can't stop the tears. And I was still standing after the 11th blow. And he said, in Japanese, pick up another overcoat. And he gave me two cigarettes. I was brushing my teeth with this charcoal. And we had to salute him every time we saw him. Either bow to him or salute him. The guards. And they were in the camp. They disregarded Geneva Convention rules altogether. And uh, I was in there brushing my teeth, and I saw his toes, and I thought, oh, my God, that's a Jap standing there. And he had, I saw the butt of his gun, and I kept going up, and I, finally I saw him. And then I bowed, but that was way too late. Then he came over, and he made noises like you were supposed to salute, and he come up with a fist. And he tried to hit me, and I, I reared back like you would do instinctively, and he missed me. And he fell over on his darn near impaled himself on his saber. And then he, that really riled him up. Then he got mad. Then he stomped me. And I thought, I don't want to die like a, like a dog just being beat to death. I'm going to make a fight for it. And I kept telling myself, if you get anywhere near a situation like I had just been in, fight for it. Take his life, too. Or spoil it, anyway. And I carried that... Uh, that thought with me for the rest of the war. We worked on one of their ships that invaded us, patched it up, welded the plates on, and the Japanese invited high-ranking officials from the Japanese Army, which probably were brigadier generals and lieutenant, lieutenants, colonels, so they served us tea and cakes, and then we launched the boat and it sunk right where we launched it. So there was a lot of face slapping going on around them. The Japanese at first wanted to drive the sick into the sea. Eventually they were persuaded to let us use part of an unfinished hospital in town. Some people did give up, but it was kind of hopeless. If you're down with uh, malaria or dysentery and You've only got this unappetizing rice with uh, 
possibly a subwatery veg, very little meat in there. Uh, it's very easy to become discouraged. Uh, a lot of dysentery at that time, malaria. I don't know about the dengue, I, but uh, the starvation got most of them there. And the water supply was such that uh, there was one spigot for five, six thousand men. And we got to the point of where we would bunch up with four or five fellas, take turns standing in line. And you stood in line 24 hours a day until you got your canteens filled. And once you uh, got them filled, then you drank your fill and, uh, and immediately got somebody back in line again. So that by the time you needed more water, you might be close to the spigot. Even at nighttime when they, um, they shut the water off. People still stood in line because if you didn't, you lost your place and you might have to start at the tail end of a big long line again. So you stayed your place. And each hour on the hour, uh, a man would come to relieve the man holding the canteens. And one of the things that haunted me most about that was the hollow canteens banging against one another as a man would shift his weight from foot to foot. And you had these hundreds of canteens going boom, 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 boom. Still haunts me today, those kind of sounds. We were hungry all the time. And a lot of people were sick. They were dying here and there. Actually, while well, down, you know, they were dying at the rate of 50 to 60 a day on the American side. On the Filipino side, they're dying 200 to 300 a day. Uh, we got to thinking that if you stayed here in this camp for six weeks, you're all dead. So the bunch of us volunteered for the first detail that come along, and we got out of there on a bridge building detail. Our work days were generally for t was we'd work for ten days on one day off, and the average work day was anywhere from 12 to 14 hours a day. A high tripod was set up, and then a, a big log, uh, a trunk of a tree was stood up underneath it, and the, and the big heavy weight above was lifted up by ropes by the prisoners of war, and, and then everyone had to let go at the same time, and this weight would drive this tree trunk into the riverbed and become a piling. We were rebuilding bridges, and my job was uh, taking it. Uh, sacks of cement and uh, mixing them with sand on a steel plate. And I had dysentery, so it, it was rough uh, carrying those uh, sacks of cement. In fact, I got lost so much weight that the sacks of cement outweighed me. And they wanted us out of there for two reasons. They wanted hostages in Japan, they wanted able-bodied men to run their war industry. Over 50,000 Allied and American troops were transported by sea to slave labor camps in Japan, China, Formosa, Burma, Thailand, and Korea. The conditions on board were unbearable. There was sickness, suffocation, and starvation. Some men went insane. Also, the unmarked prison ships were torpedoed and bombed by Allied forces. More than 10,000 men didn't survive the voyage. The name Hell Ships was coined by us because the conditions were so terrible and we lost so many, so many people died in the holes. In uh, Padang, there were some thousand prisoners 500 of us, known as the British Sumatra Battalion, were moved by ship to Lower Burma. Before we got aboard that ship, we saw a bunch of uh, civilians being taken on there. Japanese, they were taking them back to their homeland. Women, children, elderly men. And we thought, boy, we're in, we're in business. The Americans are going to know that they're taking civilians back, so we're, we'll be safe from bombing anyway, or shelling, or whatever, or torpedoes. But the next day, we got it. All the personnel that went aboard 
I had to run a gauntlet of guys with, with the Japanese soldiers with clubs, bayonets, and run through that. They took all our positions away from us, and we had to run a gauntlet until they put us down and got settled in, into the hole of the ships. I boarded ship on July 17th on a boat called the Nisio Moro. It was one hell of a ship, and it was called a hell ship, and that's exactly what it was. We started out with uh, 1,619 people, and that was officers and, and enlisted men. And we got to Moji 49 days later from Moji, Japan, with about 450. Anywhere between three weeks and a, and a month, all the time in the hold, where we were not allowed to move around. The treatment, unbelievable, just unbelievable. Some of the things that, well, it's hard to believe man could be so inhuman to other, to other people. I'm on this ship with the, with the 750 Americans. And we got uh, 300, 375 in the back hole, and there's 375 in the front hole, and it's dark. And it wasn't until 70 or 80 of them died and thrown in the ocean that, that began to get enough room to sit on the floor. And once a day, they would lower a bucket of rice and a bucket of water into this 350 men. And somebody had to have the wherewithal to quiet the men down and to keep them orderly enough so that he could pass out the rice and give each one a, a half a cup of rice. And I got so we were like rats living in a sewer with the wash of human waste in, on the floor and, and the crowded conditions and people losing their minds and screaming and hollering. And, and amidst all of this, one of the uh, Hispanic guys from New Mexico has a appendicitis attack. And the American doctor in the hole with us says that if this man doesn't get surgery, he's going to scream until he dies and drive half of us out of our heads. So he asked the ship's officer for surgery equipment. <clears throat> And the ship's captain sends down a jackknife and a needle and, and some button thread. And then they get six men and they take their spoons and bend the handles so they can be retractors. And the six men hold this man down while the doctor takes his appendix out. And then sews him up and returns the knife and the needle to the, to the ship's officer. We got close to Burma, we got bombed by our own people. They came over with just one plane, sunk the two ships with us and hit ours, and one of them was, uh, it hit a Japanese hold where they had soldiers in it and blew them up. And we limped to, uh, into Burma and it, the ship went down there. So we actually sunk off, we were, I was sunk off in two ships. A thousand of us were put on a ship to go to Davao, the island of Davao. But as men died, we passed their bodies over and they took them up and threw them overboard. And we began to get room so we could sit. The men were dying all over the place, suffocating. They had no water. So finally they relented and they said, we will put 900 men forward will keep 700 men back here, whatever number's left. We, it was arranged that you could not sit down except you had to change with the men. In our hole, it was 400 men stood up, 300 sat down. We were aboard this ship for 22 days. Seven days of it was spent in Manila Harbor the temperature was 100 degrees almost every day. It was a hot season. They had little, no sanitation except buckets they at least dropped down in there. Everybody had bowel trouble, food once in a while, and they said they got water down, but I, I can't remember getting over maybe a canteen of water the whole darn trip. Now 22 days. I was pretty well dehydrated, 
But most of those men either went mad and then they had to kill them. And it sounds like an awful thing to say, but some men became destructive when they got when they went insane, they tried to kill everybody around them, and it looked like they're going to assault the Japanese. And this is what they were looking for. We got to a place called Moji, which is on the island of Kyushu. And this is where we disembarked those that could. A lot of the men couldn't make it out of the hold of the ship, and we were, by that time, all the clothes we had were just G-strings. And we were out there, and there's crowds of people watching us on this big pier. A priest with us, Father Cummings, I don't know if you ever heard the, there are no atheists in foxholes, you ever hear that? He was uh, uh, on the ship, on the ship with us, and he would, uh, at nighttime, when it, when it started to get dark, and tried to get some rest, and these guys were screaming, cussing, and everything, and I'm probably one of them doing it, too, you know. And just at dusk, he would start uh, talking about like a football coach or a basketball coach at halftime. Hang in there, we're going to make it. Just hang in there. And every night he would do that. And they, with about two minutes, you could hear a pin drop in it, them listening to him. He, he inspired them that much. But ten minutes later, they were screaming again. But for that period, he was, uh, he was a coach, you know. Three or four days before we landed, uh, he was saying the Lord's Prayer, and he said, uh, give us to stay. That were his last words, and there's a book out with that title. Three years of their lives passed by as prisoners. Hope of survival began to fade. As the Japanese began to lose the war, they became desperate, and for the prisoners, conditions got progressively worse. Japanese were losing the war, started losing the war. For us physically and mentally and work-wise, things got worse. There was a Japanese commandant. They always stood on the box. They always had an interpreter. And he read us our rights. And the rights were, don't do this, don't do that, or you get shot or you get punished. When he got through, he says, welcome to Japan. Where were, the Japanese people would come to when the bombing raids were taken part, and then they had they were, they beat the living hell out of us guys with anything they could get, threw rocks at us, hit us with clubs, canes, anything that they could have. And it was very rough treatment in Tokyo for us guys in Dili. I got beat up one time and I was thrown into one of those little wooden houses out in the, in the main area without any heat or any food for 36 hours, and, and when they released me, I was, uh, I was unable to walk, but I crawled back into the barracks. The barracks, in the meantime, were unheated. There was no heat. We wore all our clothes. We slept in all our clothes, and our water even froze in our canteens, so we had to go to the mines to turn our thaw it out. And the first camp was a terrible place to visit. The water pump for washing uh, would pump up human waste through the pump. <laughs> it would have toilet paper would come up through the pump as you pump the water. And that was one of the reasons why I said I would not use that water for washing. I just wouldn't do it. They thought they would use all of the prisons they had to make this rail connection, a line that would be about 250 miles long. Now, such a line had been surveyed Many years before by the British, it was determined that it was not possible to build it uh, on an economical basis, and so they'd abandon it. But the Japanese got a hold of the plans and pretty much followed the trace. They would absolutely not give us any medicine, none. And after a while, when we, we just talked to them and talked to them and said, hey, if you got quinine, for God's sakes, get it. You want to build a railroad? They told us they were going to build this railroad from, um, from Bangkok to, to almost to India, across Thailand and, and Burma, which is a long way, like 260 kilometers. The reason I remember that figure is they, uh, 
they um, said they killed one one person for each tie they laid down in that 264 kilometers. I was unloading some bones or, uh, that were supposed to go for our sloop, and I weighed myself on the scale, and I was weighing at that time 41 or 40, between 41 and 42 kilos, which is roughly around 90, 90 pounds, and I was considered myself one of the heavyweights in the prison camp. Our guys would go out on working parties and they had only G-strings on and they'd go on out and they'd get enough parts on their working parties to build a radio. And they'd get people like the BC, uh, BBC from uh, Calcutta and, and they'd get the news that way. And that was a death offense. That was really sad. We used to get a lot of rumors how the war was going, but, uh, and I think that kept a lot of people alive. There, there were always rumors, you know, we, we would we'll be out by Easter. The Americans have landed on the Christmas. Uh, uh, when Easter came, well, we'll be out by Christmas. And we always believed that there were some rumors coming around, some of them containing a measure of truth from these uh, radio broadcasts that people risk their lives to take. What they had told us that they were just out of Las Vegas up there, but they captured all the, uh, all the West Coast and stuff like that. We pretty well figured it was propaganda. But that thing, we, we had no contact at all with the outside world. Guys were saying, oh, there's, uh, we heard this off of the BBC. They're going to trade prisoners of war. And one, one high on the list was the Burmese prisoners on the Hell Railway because we were in such poor shape. And we we're going to trade them for so many Japanese that were caught in some place. Just a made up nothing. But you know what? You kind of believed it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of wanted to believe it, and uh, and you did. But we did get to uh, Japan, and we we landed in uh, in uh, uh, late October, and it was cold and it was miserable. And before we left, the Japanese gave us new clothes. We had uh, new cotton pants and new cotton shirt. Well, it was no clothes for. Japan at that time of year because the wind was blowing and it was cold and uh, miserable, just plain miserable. And the, our group is split up into three different groups and I happened to be in the group that went to Nagata, Japan to work on the coal docks. And we were issued, issued overcoats. The Japanese overcoat was made from wood pulp. And if you wore it in the rain, it got so heavy you could hardly carry it. It just weighed a ton. Or even if it wet snow, you know, it, it just really weighed a ton. But it was an overcoat. And for five months, I never took my clothes off. I never washed. And if you took your clothes off at night and they were wet, they froze stiff. And you wouldn't get them on in the morning. And some couple of guys did that, and the Japs tried to make them go to work naked, and, and uh, that didn't appeal to anybody. So you wore your clothes all winter without taking them off. The war decimated the Japanese workforce. To replace these men, American and Allied prisoners were put to work as slaves in more than 40 major Japanese corporations. They toiled in copper mines for Mitsubishi, in lead and silver mines for Mitsui, for very little food and for no pay. We would have to build a stack of wood on a trail there would be elephants coming, pulling a, a wooden sled. We'd stack it on that and then they'd take it to the rail side. From there I went to Tamakan, which is uh, the side of the bridge on the River Kwai. The, the, there were two bridges built. One, a wooden bridge, which was built first to get supplies across the river. The other was a steel girder bridge, which the Japanese had stolen somewhere in Java was built by the prisoners. Uh, as soon as they had a bridge constructed, it seems like the Americans or the British would come over and bomb it. And 
blow it to heck. So we worked this copper mine owned by Mitsubishi. We walked up about five miles up the mountainside to get to the opening of the copper mine. And then we went down 338 steps into the mine. The copper mine had been abandoned, but they had been reopened and was under the auspices of the Mitsubishi Corporation, which also made uh, zero airplanes and a few other things. They took us up to a place called Hokkaido in northern Japan where we mined coal. For, there were no days off. We were anywhere from, eight, from 10 to 16 hours a day. And our rations were cut to less rice. And we were there until the war ended. We worked on a trestle about 30 foot in the air. The coal, the ship would come in and, and, and tie up the... Um, They'd have Chinese prisoners of war in the holes of the ship to fill the cargo nets, and the net was emptied into a barge, and, and the elevator would, would poke its nose into the barge and elevate the coal up to the track. I can't describe how hard it was to work in the mine, but it was le lead ore, and actually of lead ore, 10% of it's silver. That mine today is one of the richest silver mines in the world, the Mitsui mine in Kamioka, Japan. We had 33 feet of snow that winter. Once every two weeks we got a hot bath. Everybody bathed in the same water, 200 of us. The food was terrible, it was getting worse. Even the people up there were getting the same point we were. We ate all the flowers around her. We ate the dandelions. We dug up roots, we ate the bark, the inside of the bark of the tree. In the last week or 10 days of the imprisonment, we were eating boiled grass. This is how bad off we were. And the Japanese getting to look like us. When we got to the copper mine, the, uh, the first day they were there, the, the uh, Japanese officer in charge said, if, uh, if Americans ever set foot in Japan, you will be executed. So the future didn't look too good. Well, we were told by the Japanese soldiers that the day the Allied invaded Japan proper, that all prisoners of war, regardless of rank or nationality, were to be taken care of. We learned after the war that they had actually planned to murder all of the prisoners and bury them in these ditches. We had about finished the railroad when uh, we heard about the atom bomb. The Americans had dropped a bomb that, uh, that uh, killed uh, all the people in one city. And he said, one of the American officers, no, it couldn't be. It must have been a thousand bombers that must have been over and killed them. We didn't know the war ended until some B-29 flew over and dropped pamphlets after the war was over to spread blankets and stuff on the, on the ground to let us know where the prison camp. A B-29 came over and parachuted food and medicine. We didn't know there were bombs, but we knew there were some big events happened in town or in, in the country someplace. <laughs> and, uh, and two fellas says, hey, this war is over, this war is over. We'll go down to Tokyo and we'll find the Yanks. They called us together in one group, in one formation in the morning, and he said the Japanese, he gave a speech in English this time. He spoke English, not through interpreter, but the first time we heard him speak English kind of broken English, and he said the Japanese and, people, and Americans were at peace, that we were friends. 15th, the Japanese said it's somebody in the royal family's birthday, there'll be no work today. That was the 15th, 14th here. The next day was the 16th, they announced, they said an honorable peace between the United States and Japan. And, uh, and there was no emotion shown. Most of the men just said, we made it, that's all. 
we had run out of food. We had taken over the camp. And we were going outside of the camp to the farmers around and helping ourselves to their potatoes and their chickens, their ducks and whatever there was to take. And we'd just take it. But he said, whatever you do, if you leave camp, don't go into Nagasaki, it's radioactive. And what we thought, what, a lot of radios? What did we know about radioactivity, you know? And we were about, I don't know what the distance, 25, 30 miles across the bay from it. And we went through there a month later, and it was, uh, the stench was horrible, just horrible. We saw things off in the distance where uh, buildings, and you see plumbing just sticking up, no building around, just plumbing. So it's, I don't know what the stacks consisted of, but off in the distance, one looked like it was perfectly straight, and the other one went up like that, and ended up what, it, uh, what the angle was like that, you know. It was, uh, I thought the whole city had gone, really. These planes came over and they dropped some leaflets one day. And uh, General Wiedemeyer, I remember that name forever, he was, uh, he was the big gun over in the CBI. And he signed the leaflets. The problem was, we were, it was a death offense to pick up the leaflets and read them. But the, and, and then it got windy or air current or something. We missed, he missed the camp, that first guys that came over by about half a mile. The wind blew the leaflets out, but the natives put them around rocks, and they come in. Uh, they threw them in the camp, and, they, and the, the leaflets said, "The war is over." And it was over. This was almost 30 days after uh, after uh, VJ Day. People have asked, "How did you survive?" Now, it was helpful to have the right attitude, to be able to accept what was happening and make the best of it. It helped to have the, a good friend or friends. It helped to have money to be able to buy stuff or it helped to have something you could sell for money. But mostly it was a matter of luck. It was luck that my friend, uh, the mosquito that bit him, didn't bite me. I got down to 94 pounds at one time and uh, I had weighed, uh, when the war broke out, I weighed 182 pounds. I don't think one minute did I ever think that I'd not get out of there. I just wouldn't let myself even come close to thinking that. Well, I guess I just made up my mind I wanted to get home, and uh, so that, that helped me. You had to have the will to survive, and I apparently had that will to survive, even though I went through some pretty rough times, ordeals and so forth. And uh, I was in pretty bad shape. Another year, I wouldn't have been here. Another year as a prisoner of war or a captive, I would never have been here. I think a lot of us, I would say 90% of us wouldn't have been here either. I tell you, I kissed this ground for I don't know how many times when I got back and touched it. And you see that flag out there? I fly her every day. Every day unless it's stormy, bad weather and I make sure it gets down at night and gets up in the morning. Over 300,000 Allied and American troops were captured in the beginning months of the war. More than 100,000 of them did not live to come home. 